Every DJ's journey is the same. You get inspired by your favorite DJ and you take action, but you need music. You need to learn the basics. You need to master extended mixes, experiment with different genres. You need to level up your transitions, share your skills with the world on social media. You need to get gigs and learn how to play on pro equipment and build systems to enable you manage your music correctly. So with all that in mind, we are here to help. For the first time ever, we have put together a free DJ course that touches on every single one of these steps that a DJ takes in their journey. Each lesson is taken directly from one of our many online DJ courses that have taught over 15,000 DJs worldwide how to DJ. So no matter what stage you're at as a DJ, I guarantee you will learn something of tremendous value in this course. I'm excited, let's go. Let's get stuck into the first lesson taken from our Flex 4 course, and it is the fundamentals of DJing, beat matching and timing. All the music in this lesson can also be downloaded for free. The link is in the description. Now we're going to need to perfect that timing. And just like I said in the last lesson, due to human nature, we're not going to press play on beat every time. But let's say it's getting to the point in the track where you want to mix the track in, you think this is the right moment, you press play and you've got to commit to it, but you haven't pressed play perfectly on B. We can't then cue it back up because we've missed the point that we want to mix the track. So we've got to move over to the jog wheel and we've got to use the jog wheel to nudge the track in time. Just like we mentioned before, the jog wheel is a temporary adjustment and we're there to nudge the track back in time and you know fix that little error in pressing play slightly off B. So this jog wheel is really useful for doing this and correcting those slight mistakes we make when pressing play. Obviously, we want to press play as on beat as possible. We don't just want to press play randomly and then try and do everything with the jog wheel. You know, at least try and catch it on beat and then use the jog wheel to correct that issue if there is a slight discrepancy between the beats. So let's do this again and let's try and count along. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one. So I press play slightly wrong on purpose there. So this is where you can hear the beats. I've got this sort of double action going on. Now we move over to the jog wheel of the song that we've pressed play on. And then at this stage, you won't know, you know, do this without looking at the equipment. Do this, you know, with the, with the laptop and the waveforms turned away or hidden. And at this stage, what we want to do is use the jog wheel and our ears to try and figure out when we apply an action, does it sound better or worse? And with the jog wheel, we're going to think about it as a clock face. And I would recommend getting this muscle memory built up from the start. So even though you're using a controller, try and get used to doing adjustments that are short and sharp like this. The reason being for that, if I just put it back where it was, the reason being is that as you go into say CDJ jog wheels, these are called mechanical jog wheels, and they actually, um, they adjust as to how much, how fast you adjust the track. So if you were to go like this on a mechanical jog wheel, it's not gonna do any sort of nudge or movement. They like short, sharp nudges like this. And by doing sort of a quarter turn on this clock face um, in this circle, we can start to build up this muscle memory in our brain and we can hear, okay, if I do a quarter turn, it adjusts the track by X amount. If I do another quarter turn, okay, I can hear it adjusts it again. Or you could think it's quite far out, I need to do a half turn and you get used to, you know, what a quarter sounds like, what a half sounds like, backwards and forwards, um, and even just, you know, maybe an eighth like this, a little tiny adjustment. So let me just go back to the top and then what we want to do is try these adjustments, nice short sharp adjustments and always listen, does it sound better or worse? Not too bad, let's do one that's slightly more off beat. Catching it on beat now. There we go, so we press play, slightly off beat. Moving to the jog wheel, at this stage, just try one way or the other. It doesn't matter, just try faster. So I think that sounded a little bit better, but let's do one more go to check. It's not getting worse, let's go again. So hopefully you can hear there that these adjustments are making it sound better. 
Now if I keep going, you'll hear it start to sound worse again. That's indicating we've gone too far. So let's go back the opposite way. And what we're listening out for when we play two songs that are exactly the same, and this is a great tool for obviously learning this technique. When we play two songs that are exactly the same, we get this phasing effect. So when they're perfectly aligned, can you hear how that sounds like the sort of these frequencies are sort of dancing with each other? If I take it off, put it back on. you get this weird spacey effect. Off. Back on. So this is a really good way for figuring out, you know, am I on beat, am I off beat? And this only works as a tool, as a training exercise, because you'd never mix the same song into the same song. But this is where we can start training our ears to know what's right and what's wrong. And then more than anything, how much to adjust it to actually correct it. So this is where you would repeat this process over and over a few times. Oop, I'm wrong. Let's try slower this time. Now if it starts to sound worse, that sounds like it's getting further away. It means we've gone the wrong way. Now because I've done it three or four times that way, I can quickly go back to where I was. And then keep going forward. And that's what we want to try and achieve. When you get close, you know, don't be afraid of just doing little nudges like this and just listening to how it changes the sound. And there we go. And that, what you've just done there, is the basic of timing. So this is getting our timing right and, you know, adjusting the timing of two songs to match with each other so that they're playing at exactly the same time as each other. And that's just going back to that analogy of like two cars driving down the road. That means that they're both playing, they're both going at the same speed and they're staying in line with each other at the same speed next to each other. Now, unless we were to change the tempo, you know, the, by using the same songs and having them both at the zero position, they should just play in time forevermore. But if we were to change the tempo of one, then they would start to go out of time. And that's where we're going to start looking at beat matching and bringing tracks in time and manually adjusting the tempo and the jog wheel to get that timing correct. Um, it's one of the core skills as a DJ, but the first stage is just getting in control of the music, in control of the jog wheel, and just putting it on beat, taking it off beat, putting it on beat, taking it off beat, and doing it by quite a bit, you know, and then doing it by small amounts just to get used to the feel of the jog wheels, but also how the actions that you apply change how it sounds, which then builds up that muscle memory and, you know, it triggers your brain to understand, okay, I can hear when it sounds this far out, and I know that equates to maybe three nudges on the jog wheel and it starts to become second nature. So keep practicing this. Again, practice it with the different tools that are available. Just load the same one on both sides for now and just practice that over and over again. Now that you understand the basics, let's add in some EQ elements. Taken from our Techno Mixing DJ course, this lesson will show you how to slowly use the EQs for a pro sounding mix. One of the core mixing skills when it comes to playing techno music is using your EQs effectively. And with techno, everything is really long and drawn out. It's not often that you will see a techno DJ mixing a tune in every one to two minutes. A lot of these artists like Charlotte DeWitt, Adam Bayer, Amelie Lenz, there's so many out there, but they all tend to do like these really long drawn out mixes. Some of them might be over like seven minutes long per transition. Now, a lot of this is just due to the way that techno is produced and more about taking the audience on a journey rather than how many techno tunes can I play in one hour. It's more about, you know, getting a real good feeling, building up energy, bringing it back down again, opening up to like a big atmospheric breakdown, things like that. But one of the things you really need to nail with this genre is EQing. So what I'm going to show you right now is how I would go around EQing in one track to another, a basic blended mix, but show you how to do it effectively. Now, 
what I'm going to do is start with this track rave on the left hand side. Now I'm just going to go towards this drop that I found here. So the number one there, just here, what I'm going to do is set a cue point there for now just as a marker. And then what I want to do is I know that when that track drops on the number one, that's when I want to start off the track on the B side. Now, this is all down to phrasing. Now, um, you might have seen a video on phrasing before in our beginner courses. But anyway, this is what helps you get from one track to another a bit more seamlessly. Now, when these two are set off at the same time, I know that I can bring this track out and as I start to bring it out on the left hand side, something new will be introduced on the right hand side every 32 or 64 beats. So I'll just give you a demonstration of how that sounds and you'll start to hear things come in. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring down the EQs on the right hand channel here. I'm going to take all the lows out of it because techno is fueled by big kick drums and low end. As you can hear there, heavy low end on both tracks. So we're going to start by taking out all of the low end. I'm going to take away some of the mids and the highs. Now what I want my goal to be by the end of this transition is to basically have the hot cues on the right hand side looking the same on the left hand side. So you want to imagine it's like swapping these two channels over. So I want to go from here to here, here to here, here to here, basically. Now that's going to be the ending point of our transition. So I'm going to put this into practice and I'm just going to set the track off in my headphones. So we've got deck one going over here. So let's go back. Set it off. I'm just going to beat match that up in my headphones. And we'll start to bring it in. And then what I'm going to do start to transition over some of the frequencies so I'll start with the low end on this switch here so I've moved over the low end we can maybe start with some mids now do the same for the highs. And I can just start to bring those down even more. Start to bring down the volume. And there we go. As you can see, I've achieved exactly what I wanted to do. I've switched over the EQs. I'm in the same position on the left hand side as I started the transition on the right hand side. And then we're into the next track on the right hand side. And you can hear that it was seamless. Now, by all means, you could change this around in the order. Like I went from the low frequencies first upwards but you could start with the high frequencies, switching out the highs, and same with the mids, and then go to the lows at the end. It's up to you, whatever you find is most effective for the two songs that you are transitioning. Now, a good thing to practice is, I finished the transition with my EQs like this, but what is really good practice is that when you're finished mixing out whatever tune, reset your EQs back to the middle position, and then you know you don't have to worry about it, it's back to where it should be, how the producer intended to have the song sounding. So what I'm going to do now is we'll have this song carry on playing. We're near the drop. I'm going to choose another track and start to mix in from this tune here that we've just transitioned into. So I'm just going to pick a track, choose this one here, and we'll see what elements we're working with and see what is going on inside of the track. Let's have a listen through. 
So for a start, I'm just gonna move up the BPM. You see we're at 131 here. So I'll just move this track up. There we go. And just gonna go through and see what we've got. Right, as you can hear, that's really heavy, very acidy. So we'll start by mixing this in. So as you can see in the first transition, we exited the mix on the first track into the second track around here. So we're in this breakdown. So from here, I've loaded the track into the next deck and I'm gonna just turn on my EQs back to the 12 o'clock position so I can hear it clearly in my headphones. And then we're gonna start, we're just hitting it on the number one like we did in the last transition. So you can see it's coming up here on the waveform. Get ready on the hot cue. Over the cue point, sorry. Just adjust that with my headphones. So I've got that beat matched. And what I'm gonna do is bring down the EQs, start to mix this in. Now this time I might start with the, the mid frequencies. Might start to change over the highs. And then start to move over the lows. And switch them on this phrase change right now. So again, we've moved our EQs from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. We're at the same position that we started with. Take them out even more. You can hear a little bit of the vocal coming through. You can keep that in there if you want, if you want it to like a loop. But I'm just gonna take them out for the time being. And there we go, seamlessly gone to another track again. So like I say, they are the core basics of your EQ mixing, going seamlessly from one track to another. Now, going back to in a previous lesson, this also ties in with your phrasing and mixing in key. You will notice that the first two tracks that I used in this example were both in the same key as each other. Now, this is obviously going to result in a much cleaner, seamless mix. You know, you're not going to notice a, a shift in energy because they're both in the same key as 3A. Now, it's just going to make it seem much more smoother and keeping the same level of energy. And the same with your phrasing. We were setting that off on the number one so that we know we've gone 32, 64, 124 beats ahead. There's going to be crossovers at the same time. One track is going to be taking things out. Another track is going to be introducing things. So everything will start to tie together. Like I said at the start, the building blocks, you will see patterns starting to happen as we progress throughout the course. Once you've learned the basics of beat matching, timing, catching the number one, it's all about repetition. Once you feel comfortable with this process and you've experimented with EQs, then it's time to move on to making extended mixes. Now is the really exciting bit where we get to perform extended mixes. So putting everything we've learned into practice and just using our newly found DJ skills to now create an extended mix. I've not planned anything. I'm just using the house folder um, from the music pack. And I'm just going to not do too much talking because you'll be able to see what I'm doing and you should have the understanding of where phrasing is coming in and these filters and these EQs. But I'll kind of talk you through a little bit of my process as I kind of create each mix. So let's go. So just 
it's loaded in my next track and I'm just going to match up the BPMs slowing down this one slightly matching it up at 128 and on this drop I'm going to hit play 1, 2, 3, 4, play I'm in my headphones here, the Q just listening to make sure my timing's right I'm going to start it again for this new phrase play now let's start mixing this in it's on beat let's start swapping these bass frequencies out I just use a filter right at the end there just to sweep across our frequencies for a nice sounding mix. So again, because we're counting in phrase, I don't have to really wait to the end of the track for the outro of the track. As long as I'm mixing on phrase, it will sound good. I'm gonna slow this tempo down a little bit. in my next track, match up the BPMs, 1, 2, 3, 4 and play, Just checking everything sounds okay my headphones, One, two, three, four, and play, This sounds good, so I'm going to cut the bass and just introduce this track slowly. Slowly start replacing these frequencies. Again, super nice sound, cleaning. A clean sounding sorry blend there again just going to put my filters my eq sorry back to 12 o'clock good habit to get into Just noticing in my headphones that the intro to the next song has some vocal in it, so I don't want two vocals clashing. So I'm just waiting for the right time to mix this in. This time using this filter.
So there, I just use that little smart fader, which is giving me a little bit of an echo there, just for that nice clean sounding transition. Also using the filters to mix that one in as well. see now from this waveform that this has, this has quite a long build-up section here so I'm not going to mess around and try and bring it in on the build-up we can still be listening in our, head, in our headphones to see what the intro sounds like does it just have drums is there a vocal is there a melody remember we want we don't want anything clashing outro now of this track let's begin to mix this in start swapping in frequencies keeping it in time with the jog wheel One thing that we are passionate about teaching is learning to mix different genres. In this next lesson, taken from our hip hop mixing DJ course, we're going to switch it up to hip hop and learn how to make hip hop mashups, which is a technique that can be applied to any genre. We're gonna be talking and learning about mashups. A mashup, if you don't already know, is one song completely mashed up with a different song. So you take an instrumental of a track and then you put a different vocal over it from a different song merge the two together and you get one brand new track. And mashup mixing can really set your DJ set apart from other DJ sets, give yourself some personality and some individuality into your creative DJ sets. So let's take a look at a mashup and then we'll talk about the best practices about how to go about creating one. So this is what a mashup sounds like. We're gonna use two different tracks, an instrumental of Still Dre and an acapella of All Gold Everything. So when making a mashup, we're going to have to think about mixing in key quite a lot. But it's not super, super important all the time within hip-hop music. And what I mean by this is a lot of rap music that have rap vocals, 
they rap in a monotone, so they're not following along with chord progressions like a singer would do in a standard pop track, for example. So mixing in key using a rapper, like this track by Trinidad James, Gold all in my chain. you don't have to worry too much about that being in key because it's kind of all at one tone. Whereas there are some hip hop tracks that do have a rapper rapping and singing like a Drake track or like this J. Cole track where you're going to have to mix in key because even though in the verse they're rapping at kind of a monotone, in the choruses it might have backing singers in and things like that singing along to a chord progression. So we're going to have to think about mixing in key. So this example, Workout a cappella. Hey, we got a good thing. Don't know if I'm going to see you again. See, so it's a lot more melodic. But is that a good thing? Cause girl, I can't and throughout the song, man. there's some female no backing man. singers in there and things like that. <laughs> so for this one, you're going to have to refer to the article on mixing in key, just so you get familiar with mixing in key. But as you can see here, we've got two tracks that have been analysed as 8A. So these are going to work together. So if we just press play and create this mashup. Another thing to note is when working with acapellas, your software will nine times out of ten not give it a correct beat grid. And that's because there's no beat for the software to be able to pick up on. It doesn't have a snare, or it doesn't have a kick drum, then a snare, a hi-hat. So it can't figure out any beats. So if you're kind of using sync, for example, and relying on sync, you might go out of time and off beat. So that's just something to bear in mind. Also bear in mind that, again, softwares aren't 100% accurate, so the key of the song might not be 100% accurate. I've found that it's pretty close. It's usually about 95% correct. Um, but just be aware of that. If it sounds a bit off to you, then it probably is. But I've added some instrumentals and some acapellas inside of our playlist. So go ahead, get creative, and just see what mashups you can start creating on your own. One of our most asked questions is how to transition between genres. In our DJ Transitions course, we cover this extensively. And in this lesson, you will learn how to go from a hip hop track into a house track seamlessly. Okay, until this point, we've just done wide transitions going from a higher BPM to a lower BPM. But obviously you don't want to be stuck just going from higher to lower. You may want to go the opposite way around and take it from a lower BPM to a higher BPM. So this is where you've got to be a bit more careful and a bit more selective about what songs you choose, where you choose to do the transition, because it will sound way more unnatural speeding a slower song up than it does slowing down a faster song. By slowing down a faster song, it sounds like that you're taking the energy down. But to take something that unnaturally... That, that, that should realistically be this BPM up to here can sound a bit weird sometimes. So you've got to be careful and selective about what you choose. Now we're going to use in this example Beyonce Crazy in Love and Jack and Danny Mushroom. So we've got a track that's very repetitive. Let me just go back to it and search through. So you can hear here. So it's repetitive and it's got a nice build up, which I like here. So it provides a little bit of energy in the build up, which is going to work well. Then on Crazy in Love, I've got a song here. I've got a loop here, should I say, which is nice and repetitive as well. So I couldn't just loop anything. I want to find something that will sound nice when looped over and over. Let me turn the sync off. So we could use something like this loop that I've got here. 
or if you don't want the hit at the start, we could have the second one along. And you could have something like that. We could then save it in the hot cue bank here so we can easily get to it and activate it. You could obviously have it as an active loop like we mentioned before as well. Either way, you want to activate that loop. Then, because we can sync the two tracks together, you can beat sync your faster housey song into the Crazy in Love song. Then we want to figure out where we want to mix from. So, this sounds a little bit weird because it's just a 4x4 drum beat that's slowed right down, but it could still work. Or we could use the build up, it's totally personal preference. So, what we do is just test it both ways around. So, if I beat sync this, beat sync that, let's turn this into an active loop. So, it's looping, and then let's set this one on. And we could have this underneath and then start speeding it up. You'll notice I'm doing some mixing with my right hand as I speed it up with my left hand. And then I could force it to that hot cue into the build up. Carry on mixing. And that gives us enough time, it indicates to the listener that we are speeding the song up. Yes, it doesn't sound really natural because at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day we're taking a song from like 100 BPM up to 124, 25 BPM. So you're stretching it in a way that it's not natural, but you're trying to make the best of it so that the crowd are aware of the change in BPM and that's the main thing. We can clean this up again even more by doing it all a little bit faster so we there isn't as much of a drag on the transition and it means we're getting into the next track nice and quick. Also, we could cut this and sample this song back in and out with something like an echo. So this loop. Something like that. Over the top of the drop of this side. So let's have a listen to how all of that sounds together. Let's reset everything as if not on okay right then. so to speed it up I'm just gonna get straight into the build-up and speed up over the build-up instead of the drums at the start turn beat sync on on both sides resample it back in that way. By speeding it up over this build-up, it's already quite repetitive and it sounds like a build-up, so if I take this back down again and just sync them both up, so if you imagine, let's go the other way, turn that off, turn that off. If I sync it up on this side, this already sounds quite natural, speeding up. The repetitiveness of the snares sounds quite natural. You could even leave it in like that, it sound, doesn't sound too bad. But the main thing to remember is finding a piece of the song 
that sounds more natural when it's sped up. So this is the kind of stuff that you want to kind of have your go-to songs that you use to transition um, rather than just picking a song at random live in your DJ set and going, okay, I'm going to make have a good go at this. Um, there are definitely songs that will work better than others. Just let's have a look again at the Casey Perry one and MK17. So I haven't prepared this one in any way. So all I'd be doing is searching through and trying to find something that's a nicer loop that I can then speed up. Maybe some vocal in here. Something like that could work. And then on the opposite side, we need to get into the track nice and quick. We don't want just a basic drum beat for a minute. Do we want to drop straight in? So this is where there's a vocal on this side as well, so we don't want to clash the vocals together. So I'm actually going to go and set a loop just before the breakdown. I think I might half that. And we've got a loop there. So now, if we were to mix between these two songs, um, I'll save that loop. Turn it into an active loop. Beat sync this side. Make sure they're both locked. Make sure that I'm on wide on this side. Now start speeding up. then into the next song if you can build up into a drop it will sound better because you're taking the energy level up so the crowd are expecting a bit of an impact and it will just sound a bit cleaner but if if you can't because there's vocals in the way then try and find what will work instead and that's just another way of going up in BPM rather than down using Beat Sync. Again, this works across all the different platforms, even though I'm using Rekordbox here, same in Serato and Tractor and other things. So just get familiar with how the tempo adjusts respond with one another when Beat Sync is active. You want to make sure you always sync the one that's not playing with the one that's currently playing out loud um, so that it knows which one is the master deck. Have a play around with some of your different genres. See if you can get from one song to another that is a total different BPM. Try with sort of around 120 to 130 BPM, up and down to around 100 BPM. That's a good thing to start practicing with. And then in the next tutorials, we're going to go over loads of different BPM values and different ranges as well, how to get up and down from them. But it's a very similar process. It's just figuring out different points in the song that will work best. Once you feel comfortable enough on the decks, it's time to put yourself out there and try and get some gigs. We've dedicated a full course to this called How to Get DJ Gigs. One of the quickest ways to get gigs is by creating content, and no other platform can get you in front of more fans quicker than TikTok. This lesson will show you how to edit a mix inside the TikTok editor. Now let's look at the TikTok editor. We're gonna upload the same mix to TikTok. It's a very similar process, but there are some differences. So to begin with, open up TikTok. Now we're gonna add our video, hit the big plus icon at the bottom. Again, you'll see me in the camera. And again, you get features at the side that if you are creating a TikTok from scratch using this camera, you can you know um, use. You've got the flip, so it will flip the camera. Filters, you've got the speed in which you wanna record at. Timer. Um, and then here, this is quite an important section if you're creating TikToks from scratch. You have a 15 second camera, a 60 second one, and then all the way up to three minutes. So depending on what you're filming, um, you can you wanna select the right one. But getting on to uploading a video. Click on upload and find the mix. So here is our mix. And down the right hand side are our important editors. 
that we can use. If I just turn this down a little bit at the top, you've got text. And then we've got these stickers again. These can be used for engagement. So it's not just about these, you know, random little neon stickers or anything like that. Things like ask and poll are great engagements. So again, if you want to um, get some engagement, just the same as the Instagram one, you could put rate this mix. You know, like or dislike, you know, or you can put some emojis in there. And again, TikTok loves engagement. If you don't want to use this, just drag it up to the delete section. You've got your filters. If you want to change the filter, that's fine. Um, you've got adjust clips. That's if you've got more than one clip added, which we won't go into right now. Cancel. Captions, again, if you're doing um, a speech, if you're doing a tutorial, if you're talking to camera, it will automatically generate some captions for you, some subtitles. And then you've got the voiceover at the bottom, privacy settings, if you want this to be seen by only the people that you follow, which you probably don't. So at the bottom, just like Instagram, it has um, TikTok has a story. So you can post this mix to your story if you like, just raw. But what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to edit this video. So we want to go to the text. And again, we want that first three seconds to be engaging. We need to tell them the title of the video and what's coming. So just the same as we did with Instagram, let's call this the summer anthems. We've got, if we keep clicking this A at the left hand side, it will just change, uh, add a border or an outline. You can change it if you want it to go left in the middle or right. Again, this is the speech section. So if you want to text to speech, which you know we can use on this section. So if we um, just select one of these um, sections here. Summer anthems. Summer anthems. Summer anthems. So you know you've heard that robot voice a load of times. If we were to select that, again we can change the font just by clicking on classic or typewriter or one of these various fonts. And of course, you can change the color. So let's just go for this color. And again, if you just kind of drag it around, you'll see all of the little faint pop-ups where you don't want to go. So we just want this in the middle. And again, we're gonna do the same thing as we did with the Instagram post. We're gonna have these um, tracks appear as they drop in the mix. So we're gonna go with um, one, let's change it, let's change the color. Let's go for yellow. Uh, let's go for one, Jubel. Just drag that in the middle, maybe make it a little bit bigger. You just drag two fingers and pull outwards. You've also got uh, in this mix, click on the text again. Let's go two, keep it the same. We're gonna go for fill my needs. Uh, number two and then number three was coma cat keep it the same and then four would be liquid spirit there we go keeping it the same so we've got our list of tracks there make sure they're all centered looking good and again we want these to appear um, as they as they drop in the mix so Number one will be there at the start because it's the begin beginning of the mix. So if we go to, if we just turn this up, if we go to fill my needs, click on fill my needs and you can see it says set duration. We want to set the duration and now we have our timeline at the bottom. We can make it appear or, uh, from the beginning or make it disappear at the end. So we want it to appear. So you drag the left um, hand side of this timeline to where you think the drop is going to be. Hit play. So a little bit before then. So that's fine. That's where it drops in. Then we just click tick and Summer that's done. Anthems. Then select Coma Cat. Select Coma Cat, set duration, and we'll do the same for that. Drag it to the left. So that's where it drops in a little bit before then. So I'm happy with that. Click the tick Summer and finally anthem. liquid spirit, select it, set duration, drag to where you think it drops. Maybe a bit before, a little bit before then. 
Perfect. Then we hit tick. So it's processed it, and as you can see now, it's going to show you this mix is lagging or something. I think it's because I'm screen recording. There we go. So Fill My Needs comes in. And finally, Liquid Spirit will show. And there we go. That is perfect. I'm happy with that. We go ahead and click Next. And we go come to the important cover and um, caption. So let's select a cover first. And it gives you the option to either just select um, a still image from um, your timeline, which is absolutely fine. Or you can use one of TikTok's covers. So I like to use these. And you can just title this, if you do summer anthems, you know, in quite a large text. Oops. And then you can just use both fingers and then it'll, you know, that will really stand out in your profile. So we'll click save. And then again, you want something engaging in the captions. So which track is your favorite is absolutely fine. Which track is your favorite? Question mark. If I could spell which track is your favorite. There we go. Question mark. Maybe a sun caption. And then tick, um, hash, hashtags in TikTok, super important. So hashtag DJ, hashtag DJ mix. Hashtag maybe like Ibiza anthems. Make sure you use as many as you can, Ibiza anthems. The good thing about TikTok as well, it shows you how popular the hashtags are. So if... If you're using your hashtag DJ, you can see there's 24 billion of them hashtags. Now that's not necessarily a good thing. If it's relevant, keep it. But something like, you know, Ibiza, sorry, Ibiza, maybe throwbacks, if I type in throwback. So Ibiza throwback, it's only had 95,000, but that's, that's good. It's a smaller audience. So um, TikTok only has a smaller window of people to show it to, which can be really good. So. You know, as many as you want in there. Again, you can go ahead and tag people if you're friends with people on TikTok, if you want to add in other DJs. There's also this, um, you know, tag videos. If you tag in a video, um, you can basically put the link to another video. So if you had like a part one and a part two, you could put, you know, part two to this video. If I just put, if I just go here and I put part two, dot, 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 and then it will link to that video, which is a great way to keep people, you know, on your page. Seeing as it doesn't relate to anything on this, I'm just going to delete that. But it's a great way to keep engagement on your page. You can also um, uh, mention um, other TikTokers here. Um, and then add to playlist is a great one. So you can start to create playlists and they will show on your video. So again, so if you have like a summer anthems playlist, you've got five of them. Then you might have, you know, a... Um, top five hip hop play, uh, playlist and then people can view the videos from your playlist so you go ahead and you would type in a new playlist you can see I've got a few playlists here I would add this one to mixes and hit done then there's some options to allow comments you want to allow comments um, that will create engagement allowing a duet means um, somebody else can share it and do like a split screen of it similar to Stitch as well. So just leave them on. And then you can actually share this to your Instagram. If you cl click on Instagram, you can share it to your um, Snapchat and your Twitter, or you can even forward it in WhatsApp as well. All great for engagement and sharing your video. And then it would literally be a case of hitting post and then uploading. I'm just gonna save this one to drafts. And then you'll notice that on my feed here, I've got my draft section here, here where it is saved, and I can go ahead, have a look at it, and just make sure, make sure it's, um, you know, working and it's and it's fine before I want to post it. And that is simple as that, very similar to Instagram. Instagram basically copied TikTok, basically. So it's gonna be very similar. So that is how you would upload piece of content to your TikTok. When you start playing regular gigs, you may find that the majority of venues use Pioneer DJ CDJ equipment. If you have only ever used your controller up until now, this may pose a problem. This next lesson will enable you to seamlessly transition from your controller to a standard club setup.
In this video, we're going to take a closer look at your stereotypical beginner controller and compare the features and layout to that of a CDJ and mixer setup that you would traditionally find in a bar or a club. So, first things first, navigation and loading a song. So on your controller, you usually find that you have a browse control up here on your controller where you can scroll through your software and you can scroll through either crates if you're in Serato or playlists if you're in something like Tractor or Rekordbox. So you would navigate through, find your track or say your folder that you want to enter. You can click in and then when you find a track, you can just press the load button up on the top corner to load that into a deck. Now on a CDJ, it's very much the same. Once you've exported your tracks to a USB or an SD card and inserted it into the CDJ, you can browse through by pressing the big browse button here and you can go through your artists, albums, playlists, all like that. So playlists are the closest thing you'll get to crates and what you have on your software. You can also access this area by pressing the playlist button up on the top of a CDJ 3000. But it's very much the same. You scroll through and then when you find a track you like, you can simply press in to load that track into the deck. So the next thing we'd want to do is we'd want to set our cue points. Now the cue and play button is the exact same on most controllers as it is to a CDJ. So you can use your jog wheel to find your cue points, set your cues, you can do the exact same on the CDJ as well. So your cue buttons and your play, they look the same, they act the same. Above the play and the cue button you'll find we've got the sync button here on the controller. Now the sync acts very much the same on a CDJ, you can find it just here. But you'll notice there's also a dedicated master button. When you press master, or sometimes the deck will automatically choose what the master is, but the master deck, when illuminated, means that that tempo and beat grid information will not change, the other decks will change to match the master deck. So you have a bit more option there being able to select which is the master deck compared to the controller. Your jog wheels are very much the same on a controller to a CDJ. The biggest difference is the way they're constructed. On a controller, they're called capacitive. This means it uses the static electricity in your body to detect when you're touching the top to create that scratching sound. On a CDJ, they're called mechanical jog wheels. This means they have springs underneath the actual wheel itself. And when you push that spring down, you'll notice this light illuminates to let you know when you've pushed down with enough force. That is when it detects that you're pushing down. So it doesn't use any static electricity. It's actually the force of you pushing it down. On certain controllers, you do have the ability to turn off vinyl mode. So that's when you're playing, you can touch the top. And it will scratch with vinyl mode on. Obviously it makes a scratching noise. The exact same can be found here. We have jog mode up here. Vinyl does the exact same job when playing. And CDJ mode when playing. So the exact same buttons can be found here. It's just called jog mode over here rather than vinyl mode. Moving on to the pads. Now on your pads on your controller, we've got a hot cue section here. So as most people will know, you can set hot cues throughout your track. However, on some controllers on some software when you press the hot cue it won't play the track it will only play when you press the cue down on cdj's the hot cues are found either down the section here on an older model or on the 3000 you can find them across here they're working very much the same way but when you press a hot cue it will play the track from that hot cue position so as soon as i press this hot cue a the track starts playing from that point. So if you are used to what's called gated hot cue, which is how the controller works with Serato over here, you may take a little bit of time to get used to the fact that the track will play from that point. Now let's talk about looping. Now some controllers such as the Pioneer DDJ400, 800 and 1000 will have a very similar looping layout to the CDJ with these two orange buttons and an exit button. However, if you're from an older controller or maybe you use Serato, you will be more used to the auto loop functionality like we have on this controller here. Now auto loop, when you press it, automatically sets a loop of your length that you've decided on the screen. So at the moment it's four, uh, sorry, at the moment it's eight beats, but I can halve that by pressing these down buttons or double it by pressing the double buttons. So this is how you auto loop on a controller, but on a CDJ, we've got these manual in and out buttons. 
Now the CDJ3000 does thankfully have an auto loop feature much like this button and it's a dedicated 4 beat button or a dedicated 8 beat button which then you can use those buttons again to halve or double once the loop is active. However, most CDJs might not have these if you're playing older 2000 models, you'll be used to having just these buttons up above. So we have a manual in and a manual out and then the exit button. So to make a loop work on this, we get the trap play, we press in, we press out, and there we have set our own loop. To leave that loop, you then press the exit button. Pressing the exit button again will jump you back into the loop. Now on older CDGA models, you are able to just press and hold the in button and that will start an auto loop of four beats. Like I said, the 3000 has automatic buttons here. To half or double the length of a loop once it's active, we can use these buttons underneath. The four and eight button again, you can see there's a half button here and a double uh, icon underneath these buttons. These are only available once the loop is active. So I can press a four button, half it down to two, one, double them up like that. So that's how looping works on the CDJ compared to a controller. So let's talk about the tempo fader. So the tempo fader up here on a controller is normally quite small and when you have it activated you will be able to speed up, slow down the track. It's the same principle over on the CDJ apart from it's much much larger. So the BPM is shown on the screen here and we can go up or down with much more accuracy to nail those BPMs. We also have a tempo reset button, so if we just want the track to play at the speed it was recorded at, we don't want to influence the speed whatsoever, we can press this button and it will reset this the tempo fader. You will notice on some controllers you will have a key lock button up here. This makes sure that the track plays at the same pitch no matter what speed we're playing it at. So when I speed it up, it won't go higher pitch like it is doing at the moment or lower the pitch when I slow it down. When this is activated, no matter where I have the speed of the track, it will make sure it stays at the same pitch and sound the same. Now we have the exact same thing on the CDJ, however on a CDJ it's called Master Tempo and the button is found just here. On a controller you typically press shift and press this key lock button to change the range and the accuracy of the tempo fader. Again we have this functionality, it's a dedicated button called Tempo up here and you can see the range just here on the screen. Moving on to the performance pads on the controller. Now, the performance pads on a controller evidently are not found on a CDJ. However, some of the functionality is. So we've already touched on the hot cues. However, if your controller has a pad effect mode, so on this one we have FX fade, some controllers will just have this down as pad effects. No, we have no pad effects on a CDJ. There's no such thing. The only effects you can use are on on the mixer itself, they're called beat effects down here, and this is how you would use them. Also, you'll notice that some controllers have a slicer mode. Again, slicer mode does not exist in a CDJ, so if you're planning to use that feature and you set, forget about it if you're on a CDJ. Loop roll or slip roll is available in some CDJ models, CDJ models that include the slip functionality. So in some software, you'll notice that there is slip mode, which you can press by activating on here on Serato. Alternatively, you can access this in Record Box and Tractor. I think it's called Flux Mode in Tractor. Some CDJ models, this CDJ3000, does have a dedicated slip button up here. And once you press this, you'll notice on the screen and the hot cues and the jog wheel, everything flashes that is activated by slip. So you do have the slip functionality on here. To perform a slip roll, to roll a track, and then let go of it, you will need this slip button activated and then you can press the on-screen dials here to create the same effect as you can on the controller. Finally, sampler is another thing that doesn't exist on a CDJ. So if you use a lot of samplers, it's not available unfortunately. Um, you'd have to figure out some other way of creating that effect. Moving on to the mixer section now, obviously we have an inbuilt mixer on a controller. We have a crossfader, which we can only disable in the software. The crossfader on a traditional mixer is disabled or activated by sliding these tabs across on the channel fader. So if I want channel, uh, channel 2 and channel 3 to be on the crossfader, I can simply assign channel 2 to the A side of the crossfader and channel 3 to the B side of the crossfader, which will activate the crossfader here. The up faders work very much the same as you can imagine. And then above that we have our EQ section. So we have the filter knob, which we have here. 
on the controller is just a low pass, high pass filter. On the mixer here, we can decide if it's a filter just the same. Alternatively, we can choose between different effects here as well. The EQ section is the exact same, so we have an EQ for each section of our channel. And of course, we have a trim control up top to control the gain and the volume of the track that plays out. Queuing on a uh, controller is very similar to on a mixer, so we have a queue for one and channel two. Again, we have queues on each channel here, and the master which is queued just here on the controller is actually a cue on the master strip here on the mixer. So that's them two and how they match up. Your headphone controls are moved from the center of the controller, usually to the bottom left hand corner of a traditional mixer. And then finally, we've got effects on the controller itself. Now each controller does effects slightly differently. Maybe you have a controller that has paddle effects or um, if you're using a controller like this, you'll just have the traditional one, two, three bank of, of effects and then the depth volume here. So if I get a track plane, I can then add a flanger as simple as that. You can see that in the software if I open up the tab. On a mixer, you traditionally have to set which channel you want the beat effect to assign to. So if I get it on channel two, then you select through your effects on here. So I'll get the flanger and then you want to get the track playing so it can match the BPM up and then you select the beat length value and then you can turn it on and just like you have this depth volume here so there you go that is the basics of your controller and how you do the same functions on a controller but on a CDJ and a mixer in a club being a DJ is more than just learning how to mix and show up to gigs it's a daily grind of tasks one of those tasks being how you manage your music on a regular basis. Did you know that you can automate your whole DJ library so that when you download a track, it will automatically get added to various playlists in your DJ library? This is taken from our Music Management for DJs course, and here is how it's done. Intelligent playlists in Rekordbox DJ are a really powerful and cool way to streamline your music library automatically and keep it nice and tidy. Now, how intelligent playlists work are when you set one up, you specify some rules. Recordbox will then automatically scan your music library and keep scanning your music library when new tracks are added. And if these tracks match these rules, it will be added to that playlist. So we can use this in various ways to keep our music library neat, tidy, and more importantly, once they're set up and they're working well, you can use this to just be able to drag tracks into your library and they'll automatically go into the crate ready for you to play them. So let's go ahead and get set up with Recordbox DJ Intelligent Playlist. So the first thing I'm gonna do, just so you can see this a bit better, I'm gonna put my view into browse mode just so the library is a bit bigger. And then on playlists on the left hand side here, Anywhere around this area, if you right click, you can see create new intelligent playlist. When I click this, it asks me what I want to call it. So let's go ahead and let's name our first one hip hop. So let's get Recordbox to scan all my music library for hip hop tracks and put them in one playlist for me to view. So here are the rules down here. So I want to click on genre, first of all. And then I have a few options. So there's equals, does not equal, contains, does not contain, starts with, ends with. So equals will only list tracks that have the genre category filled in exactly as I type what I'm going to type. So if I spell hip hop wrong, if maybe the track has hip hyphen hop, and I just put hip space hop, it will not come up. Likewise, the same issue occurs when you have the does not equal option. You have to be very specific. So what I'm gonna use instead, because hip hop is spelt in so many different ways, I'm just gonna go for contains. That way, when I type in hip space hop, and you'll see that it automatically tried to fill it in because it knew what I was about to type, but it will still find tracks with like hip hyphen hop, or maybe hip hop all one word it will still bring them up. So let's add that rule in and click OK. And you can see there's the smart playlist with a little cog next to it that indicates 
uh, and we can see straight away we've got all these tracks that have been added but at the top we have hip hop slash rap so that's because I went for contained rather than equals so that's worked out quite well it's found all those things for us all those tracks there's quite a lot in there so how else could we use um, intelligent playlists to our benefit well, what about if we're doing a set in a nightclub and we've been told to keep the energy high? Uh, maybe it's going to be a main room set, but of course, in the main room, you could play house, you could play EDM, um, you could play big room. There's a lot of different genres in that kind of range of 126 to 128. So what we could do is we could just set out an intelligent playlist to find us all the tracks across all those genres that are 126 to 128. So let's do that. So let's call it 126128. So now what I want to do is select BPM and I want to put less than 128. And then I'm going to add a new line, a new rule. I'm going to do the exact same BPM, but this time I'm going to do greater than 126. So now I have these two rules. The tracks cannot be above 128, but they also cannot be below 126. So let's press OK on that. And there we have it. Straight away, we've got all those tracks found. And as you can see, there's a Future House track there. There's a dance track. There's a track that's been listed as other. There's a lot where the genre isn't filled in at all. So BPMs are a great way of also being able to tidy up your library and streamline the entire thing. So let's try something with another couple of rules in there. Let's get a new intelligent playlist set up. And let's have a look what we could do here. Let's combine our genres and also the date it was added. So let's just look for recent hip hop tracks that I've added. So this is what I want. Uh, I don't want to find hip hop tracks that I added five years ago. I want to be playing the stuff that's just been downloaded recently. So now what we're looking for is we're looking for date added. And we want it to be... greater than, and let's just say 1st of January 2020. And then let's add a genre. And contains hip hop. Right, let's go ahead and click OK. And there we go. That's all the hip hop that I've recently downloaded and added into my library. Now, if I went ahead and downloaded more hip hop and added it into the record box library, either by dragging and dropping it into the master collection up here, or maybe I do file import and import more tracks, these playlists will update automatically with that new music. So once you've set up a few very well set up intelligent playlists, these will last you a very long time. They're brilliant for just setting up, you know, by genre maybe, house, hip hop, big room, R&B, Trap, Drill, whatever you're playing. And then you can just add tracks in and not have to sit there manually having to drag them into all your playlists. Record Box will just do it for you. These are all the technical skills needed to become a better DJ. But there's also a few things to avoid in your journey as well. So make sure you watch this video and whatever you do, don't make these mistakes.